Karen, and she'll be videoing it, um, so we'll be able to reflect upon this video later. So Megan, you're starring in it there. Um, and we developed this program just as a response to need that we heard from a lot of people that they really want to cook more, but they're really not sure what to do to get started. And that's what this program is designed to do. So first, what I want to do is just show you a couple of different types of knives. People look at um, cooking shows, for example, or maybe magazines, and they feel like they have to have a lot of different knives to be able to prepare the foods they want to prepare, and that's not necessarily the case, okay? So this one is a chef's knife, and if you look, um, this is all, most of this of what I'm saying to you is going to be in your packet, so. Um, but this is really an all-purpose knife here. Um, sometimes it's called a butcher knife, but chef's knife is popular. You'll find it either in an 8-inch or a 10-inch length. And this is going to be just a general, all-purpose sort of utility knife. You can use it for chopping big things or little things, big pieces, little pieces, and also use it as a scoop if you need to. Okay? And then Julia was going to borrow this one. This is a paring knife, right? Um, and this is the other knife I think you should have in your arsenal. So this is good for chopping very small things. If you like to hand chop or hand peel potatoes, for example, sometimes your mom or grandma might have done that, right? Um, but really, these two knives are pretty much all you need, okay? You can get them um, anywhere, all right? They've got them at Target. They've got them online. Um, anything you need um, done, you can pretty much get done with these two. Um, if you want to spend the time uh, to, or spend the money, I guess, to get another knife, serrated knife is another good option. This is good for cutting bread and cu um, cutting tomatoes. All right. If anyone has had difficulty maybe sawing through a really ripe tomato with a knife, okay, this serrated knife is going to help you do that because the teeth grab onto the, the thin skin of the tomato. So if you want to get a third one, I would definitely recommend that. Um, I don't know your name, but I'm going to just pull, look at your cleaver there for a second, if that's all right. Sure. This is also um, a good option here. This is a nice knife. It's got nice weight to it. Um, and this is also good for cutting through um, bone if you do a lot of meat cooking, right? It's great for vegetables, too. They do make separate, thank you, vegetable and meat cleavers, um, but really what you're going to look for on those is going to be that width of the blade, and it makes it easy for, again, scooping things off the board, all right? So once you have your knives picked out, you do want to make sure that you know how to hold it, okay? So if everyone wants to pick up their knife, and you're going to make, um, kind of make believe that you're holding a tennis racket, okay, or shaking somebody's hand, all right? And that's the kind of um, ease that you want to have with the handle. That's the sort of control that you want to have over the handle. You'll notice that I've got my thumb on the hilt of the knife, just below the blade, okay? And I've got my finger kind of wrapped around the blade to use as a guide, okay? So the thumb is going to give you some control, and the finger is going to be used as a guide. Can everyone see that? Okay, so that's basically how you want to do it. You don't want to have like a death grip on it, okay? Um, and you want to be able to have some control. This is going to help you later, all right? So just imagine you're holding a tennis racket or shaking hands, all right? And then anytime you use a knife, you want to make sure it's sharp, okay? Um, a dull knife is way more dangerous than a sharp knife, okay? Because if you have a dull knife, you're going to be exerting a lot of pressure and a lot of force trying to get that knife through whatever you're cutting, and that's where catastrophe can happen, okay? So with a sharp knife, you have that ease, you have that control, and you won't, even if you cut yourself, it's going to be a much better cut, trust me, all right? So if anyone has a sharpening steel, they probably, I didn't tell you to bring one, but does anyone have one of these at home? All right, do you all know how to use it? Okay, so it just kind of sits there in the block, right? And it looks really cool, all right. <laughs> yeah, so um, ideally, this is really for using every maybe five or six times you use the knife. Some people will say every two times you use the knife, but we're not that hardcore here. So, um, But this is going to keep sort of a general edge on the knife. You should still take it to be sharpened professionally if you can, um, you know, a few times a year, depending on how often you use your knife. Um, they used to do this at some grocery stores, I'm not sure if that still happens. There are sort of knife professionals around the area that would be able to sharpen it for you. Um, so that's a good idea if you really are going to use your knife fairly often. 
But if you're doing this at home, okay, you're going to hold the knife the same way, all right? So you can see I've still got some control here. And you're going to hold the knife. There's a few different ways you can hold the sharpener. One of the most stability is going to be holding the sharpener against the cutting board like this. I mean, if you want to watch cooking shows, you'll see, you know, it's like super fast and everything, and they're doing it towards them, and people get nervous. You don't have to do that, okay? So just hold the sharpener on your board or on a solid surface, and have the knife at a slight angle. And what you want to imagine is that there is a matchbook in between your knife and the steel. That's what this is called. And that's the kind of the angle that you're looking for. And then just bring this against the steel. Notice that I'm bringing it toward me pretty slowly from tip to tip, all right? And then flip it and do the same thing so you get the other side of the blade. And you're gonna do this about 10 times, okay? And you can do it slowly at first and then speed up as you get going, all right? But if you can't speed up because it makes you nervous, that's okay too, okay? So you do want to do this, again, every few times that you use the knife. All right? Any questions about that? All right. So what we're going to start off with are some really easy kinds of cuts. And the kinds of vegetables you have in front of you um, sort of exemplify how you'd be cutting those, right? What cuts you'd be using. So we're going to start with an onion. This is the one that everyone asks about. Um, and ideally, um, your onions will be round, okay? So um, we're going to assume that everyone has a nice round onion. And the first thing you want to do is look at the root end. So the hairy part, that's the root end, okay? The other part's the stem end, right? And we're going to start with cutting the root end, okay? Just like this, all right? So not, don't take a whole lot off, all right? But we're going to go on and take that root end off. And while you're doing this, keep your fingers, if you can, away from, yep, you all look like you're doing a good job. Good. Okay. Is anyone struggling with their knife at this point? All right. So, and then you're going to do the same thing. You're going to cut off the stem end. All right. And just give that a slice. And so you want to get your peel out of the way. Sometimes it's good to have like a little garbage bowl on your counter. There are garbage cans placed around you in case you need them. Also, okay. I compost, so if anybody wants to make a little compost pile, nice. I'll collect okay. it, and that would be appreciated. So, <laughs> All right. Um, and then, again, you're just going to cut your onion in half, okay? So the, way, the reason why we put the ends off is we've created a flat surface for your onion to sit on, all right? It's not going to be rock and rolling all over your cutting board there. And you want to do that with pretty much anything that you're cutting is creating that flat surface first. So now you can just go on and peel your onion. And the beauty about having a sharp knife when you're cutting an onion specifically is as you cut you're bruising those onion cells less so you're actually going to be releasing less of those gases that make you cry while you're chopping the onion. Um, these have also been refrigerated, and so that tends to cut down on the tears a little bit, too. All right, so. But if we all start crying, we all have waterproof mascara on, right? So. And contacts. And contacts, excellent. Yeah, that can help, too. Get that going. And then once you've got it peeled, it really is cutting in a grid pattern, okay? So what I want to call your attention to, though, before we do that, is we've got this bigger flat surface here, okay? So that's good. We've got some stability. But we also want to have some stability with our non-dominant hand, with our non-knife hand. And this is called, affectionately, the claw, all right? So if anyone, everyone wants to hold their hand up, their non-dominant hand, and kind of make a claw, okay? And you can look here and see that from your second knuckle down to the tips of your finger is almost like a straight plane, okay? You want to keep that as straight as you can and not have your knuckles facing out, because if your knuckles are bending out, they're getting in the way, mm -hmm. all right? And that's not what we want to have happen. But having this claw here, you're even stabilizing this even more, all right? And when you have your knife in your other hand, 
these fingers from your second knuckle down are sort of functioning as a guard. All right, they're protecting your thumb, they're protecting the rest of your fingers. So when you have your knife going, you always wanna keep the tip of your knife against the cutting board. And it should be a smooth motion. I shouldn't hear this, all right? What you're doing here is dulling your knife, especially if you're working on a plastic or ceramic board, okay? So what you're doing is making smooth cuts and your knife is never leaving the board. And you may not even be going all the way down to the last layer of the onion, okay? And as you're cutting, you're moving your non-dominant hand back. Good. Keep your fingers tucked in, Megan, there. Yep, there you go. Yep, exactly. So you want to keep that claw. Good. Anyone having trouble with that one? Good. Your knife Your knife fell? Yeah. yeah. I mean, and that can... So, again, just in underlining the importance there. Good. And once you've got that, and see how it remains, for the most part, intact, right? And then you just turn that onion at a 45 degree angle, and you slice across it the other way. that require an onion, pretty much. Okay? Is this much different than what you're doing at home? Some? A little no, bit. Some, yes, a little Just bit. A little. Okay, okay. Yeah, so this is what's going to be a dice, all right? Sometimes you'll find that an onion, recipe, a recipe with onions calls for strips, and if that's the case, then you would stop with that first cut, okay? And that's where you would come up with something that looks like this. This is nice if you're doing, like, caramelized onions or something, or maybe putting them on the grill. Yeah, okay, so let me, so when you're at that point, and this is the point I think you're imagining, yeah. right? Uh -huh. Just flip it down, back onto the board, all right? And then you again have that bigger flat surface area, and then you can just continue to cut. Make sense? Okay. All right, so I'm going to hand around some bags. Cleaning, I just want to address, sometimes people ask me what kind of cutting board is best. Does anyone have any questions about that? Or are you all pretty clear on that? What kind is best? Um, it really depends. So you'll notice I've got a wooden board. Um, and a wooden board is fine as long as you clean it well. All right. If you do get a wooden board, you do want to make sure it's a hard wood like maple or bamboo, and that's going to keep it from splitting or cracking, okay? Um, bamboo is been found pretty much universally, all right? And when you have a wooden board, you want to make sure that you wash it well with a scrub brush and warm water, and then let it air dry, or you can blot it dry with a paper towel, okay? You don't want to put them in the dishwasher. Sorry? Yeah. When you're doing the first cut, you said the onion just kind of staying intact. Mine kept sticking to my knife and like flying all over the place. Is there yeah. a way to stop that? Or? Um, some of that's going to be if your knife is sharper, then it's going to make those cleaner cuts and it won't be sticky. So, <laughs> yeah. Does anyone else need more Ziploc bags? Are we good? 
So if you have the wooden board, look for maple or bamboo, let it air dry. Don't put it in the dishwasher. If you have a plastic board, um, then you can definitely put those in the dishwasher, okay? They, some, sometimes they will, um, over time, crack or chip. And when something happens like that, you want to try and think about replacing your board because if there's a crack or a hole, then that's where bacteria can get in and cause some nasty stuff, right? Um, ideally, you would use different cutting boards for raw meat or for vegetables, okay? Sometimes people label them, sometimes they color code them. You can look here, this is just an example. I got this at Target. Um, and they color code it for you. So they use purple for cheese, red for meat, yellow for poultry, and green for vegetables. It's pretty cute, it's inexpensive. And you'll notice on one side they have grippy surface. And so this is helpful if you have slippery countertops or wet countertops. If you're not using a cutting board with a grippy surface, you can dampen a dish towel or paper towel, put it out um, underside, underneath your cutting board, and that'll keep it steady. All right, because you don't want your cutting board sliding all over the place. Okay. So what should you use to clean the cutting board? A is scrub brush and or? yeah, warm water. Um, running is fine and a scrub brush and maybe a little bit of dish soap, okay? Um, once in a while, you do want to sanitize it. And you can sanitize it either with white vinegar and spray that, or you can take a sink full of water with a cap full of bleach, submerge your cutting board, and this can be done either in with a wooden or plastic board. Um, submerge it for about five minutes and let it air dry again, or blot it with a paper towel. Of course, if you're doing a plastic board in the dishwasher, that's going to sanitize it too. All right, let's go on, let's see, peppers. This seems to be a tricky one for some. I see some nodding. All right, I'm gonna show you maybe a little cheat for peppers, okay? And lots of us, when we're cutting peppers, we tend to do in half, right? And then you try to get all of the membranes out and seeds, and that can be kind of an issue. Does anyone do it differently? Yeah. How do y'all do it? Do the top first. Okay, that's even harder, you guys. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to show you a little bit of a cheat, and done right, you're not going to waste. Okay, so look at your pepper, admire it, um, and then look and see where the stem ends, okay, where that top green part ends. And you're going to cut, if you're looking at that pepper, you're going to cut just to the right of that stem, okay? Now, whether or not it's, I've given you, most of those are flat. If they're not flat and if you're uncomfortable, you can always lay it down on its side and that gives you a flatter surface, okay? But either way, just cut down like that. Yeah, like a mango. Exactly. Oh, and I'm sorry you have a dish pepper <laughs> Oh, brilliant. Okay. No, it's all right. You're good. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, and then you're going to go along. Now, you've created a nice flat surface here. So go on and take that flat surface, put it on the cutting board, and then go around the stem the same way you did that first cut. Good. How's everyone doing? Good. And then with that little bottom part, if you do have it, you can just make a nice little cut, and you'll get a little square that looks like this. Again, a nice flat, easy to cut shape. Everyone with me so far? Jules, you good? There you go. Yep, there you go. Everyone good? Okay. And then, depending on your taste, your preference, how pretty you want your pepper, okay? Some of them may come out looking like this, with no membrane. Some of them may come out looking like this, with a little bit of membrane. And so this is something Again, your preference. You can either pull it out with your fingers or you can use your knife and sort of fillet along the edge. But that is completely up to you guys, okay? So whatever you want to do. But once you have this rectangle or square, whatever, you're able to lay it on your cutting board and we're going to cut it into strips and these are going to be called batons, all right? So cutting it into lengthwise strips, and yeah, if you want to get your membrane out, that's fine or not, and that's fine. All right, but cutting it into strips here. Is it always best to cut with the, the inside facing out? It is up to you. It okay. depends on how flat your pepper surface is. Yeah. Okay. 
So if you have one that's like this, then it, you can do it either way. If you have one that's really curved, then you may want to turn it around, whatever you're most comfortable doing. All right, in the beginning, you know, especially, just do it as you're most comfortable. The only issue, if you're doing it skin side out, is if your knife is not very sharp, then it can be difficult to cut through that pepper skin. So that's why I usually just do it skin side down. All right, and then once you've got strips like this, again, you can use these for like a veggie tray, right? Or you line them up so they're all together and you make that claw, okay? And again, you can dice whatever size you would like. So this is going to be a nice size maybe for soup, okay? If you were making something like a fresh salsa, you would make those batons even thinner. You can see how these are smaller. Okay, and then you would make something even smaller. And then this is gonna be nice for like a fresh salsa. Y'all can practice with that for a little bit. I can walk around and see if y'all have any questions. So what I feel like the first time yeah. of this. Yeah. Right, so would you recommend cutting it again? Yeah, you can absolutely cut it again. So let me just show, take it and show everyone what we're talking about here. So Monica is asking, what if your pepper is looking like this? Okay. And so there's a few things you can do. You can pull out the membrane using your hands. All right. And that's a little tedious. If you're going to use, maybe you have a paring knife, or maybe you're comfortable with this knife now, you can also cut it, the rib out along the surface of the pepper, and then you'll have something like that, okay? Or you can do what Monica was suggesting too, is just making a smaller cut, and then that way it might be easier to get at that membrane, okay? that's when you'd be wanting to use the claw. Okay. Right? And you're keeping your fingertips in and your knuckles are exactly right. Good. Okay, yes. But you're doing fine. Okay. Good. Is everyone good? And again, when you're cutting these, just like I said with the onion, you want to try and keep that tip of the knife on your cutting board, right? So if anyone watches basketball, I don't know if anyone does, um, just like a pivot foot, all right? You'll see when they're under the basket, they always keep the foot planted, all right? It's going to be like your knife. You always keep the tip planted, and you move this side, okay? And that's how you have the most control. Oh, nice. Yeah, of course. So if you have your knife on the board, you're going to keep your tip planted on the board. You got your claw, and you're only moving your hand where the handle is. And this is very useful for a chopping technique. So you have fan out. Yeah, exactly. You're almost creating a fan. Yep. And that's where you get a lot of control. And that part, this sort of skill, is going to be really useful when we're going to our next thing, which is garlic, okay? Um, so garlic, does anyone buy like bolts of garlic and they have no idea what to do? Oh, right? I don't I don't okay, good, yeah. Sometimes it can be difficult to chop up, right? Um, and in which case, definitely, you know, get the pre chopped garlic if it's gonna get you to be using garlic because it's a great flavor enhancer without having to use a lot of junk, right? But if you're curious on how to cut up garlic, this is a bowl of garlic. This is a clove of garlic. People get these confused. So if you're reading your recipe and it says two cloves of garlic, it's these two. Okay, it's not two. All right, so sometimes you can just get your thumb in there and separate the cloves. Sometimes if you've had a really bad day, right, you might take your hand, okay, and you might smash it. Okay, you would want to do that on a cutting board. Um, it's a great stress reliever, so I recommend it. 
you're going to use a similar technique, okay, when you're getting the skin off of the garlic. So you've got your clove, all right, lay it flat on your board, as flat as it can go. And I, I have enough for y'all if you want to try this. How do you feel about smelling like garlic today? Fine. You all right? Okay. Here, I'll smash some more. If y'all want to pass these around. So you're going to take the flat side of your knife, okay, and you're going to hold it on top of the clove of garlic, all right, and then you're going to take the heel of your palm, and you're going to get out some more aggression. You're just going to press down, squeeze it down, and you'll see that it pops the skin right off. Now this is going to be easier with a big knife. Would you want to try that? That's okay. You guys okay. 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 Or you could just use your hand. But you'll see that not only does it take the skin off, but it starts the chopping process for you. Okay? So it does, it makes it really easy to mince garlic. So if you see chopped or minced garlic for a recipe, you can use, again, that fan or that pivot technique to start chopping your garlic. And you go across it one way, turn it 45 degrees, just like we did with the pepper and with the onion and then chop it the other way. Why do you do this versus a garlic press? Yeah, you know, garlic presses are hard to clean, and they're one of those tools in the kitchen that is good for one thing only, and so I tend not to use them. Um, if you're comfortable with using a garlic press, then by all means use it. You'll get the same result. Okay. Um, some garlic presses come with a little self-cleaning mechanism, and so that makes it a little bit easier. It's just I prefer just to chop. Good question. How's everyone doing with that chopping? Any questions about that? You feel comfortable? This is where a cleaver can be a good idea too um, because it makes it easy to transfer something minced like that into your pot. Okay? So, but you can also just do it on the blade of your knife. And we're coming up to about time. Um, I can show you either butternut squash Basil or a carrot? Basil. Do we have consensus? Yeah. Basil? Yeah. Basil good? Yes. Yeah. Okay. If anyone stays longer, I can show you something else too. All right. So this is fresh basil. And you can see this is how it comes, right? So what we're going to do with this is take each leaf off of the main stem, all right, after you wash it, of course, but we'll pretend it's washed. Okay? And you, what you're left with is a pile of leaves. You want to stack them on the board so it's just a little flat layer. All right, y'all see. And if this is probably easier just for me to show you, but once you're on the board like this, you're going to roll it like a burrito. So you're left with like a nice little, right, a little brave basil burrito. And then once you've got that roll, you take your knife, again, keeping the tip on the board and just slice it through. <coughs> and you're only going to slice one way. And when you're left, what you're left with are these nice basil <coughs> ribbons. And these are great for garnishing pasta or chicken, or if you just want to you know, put it on a tray. And Tomatoes and mozzarella, right? Delicious. But they're really pretty, OK? And I do want to press upon you again Having that sharp knife is going to bruise the basil less, so it will stay greener longer, which is especially important if you're making like a tomato mozzarella platter, okay? So that sharp knife is really going to come in handy. It won't get all black like basil sometimes can do. Does anyone, anyone want to try doing that basil? I've got some extra. Y'all got time. Yes. Okay. Carrot, I can do. So what if you want basil smaller? 
collar like for like, a soup or something. Yeah, this is actually a good size for soup also. Um, anytime you use fresh herbs, all right, especially fresh basil where the flavor is just like so great, you want to add it to the end of your cooking process and that's where you're really going to preserve the flavor. So if you're using dried herbs, you can go on and put them in in the beginning of the, the recipe, but that would be a really great size. Okay, if you want to chop, you know, just like, it would be really similar to doing like what you did with the garlic, but yeah, you can just do it. So keeping that tip of the knife on the board, turning it 45 degrees, and just chopping. While that's going around, Monica said something about the carrot. Okay, so these are unpeeled, clearly, but there's a few ways you can cut a carrot. The first thing, though, that you want to remember, and this is pretty, like, you know, elementary, I guess, but remember that the tip is um, not as wide as the top. Okay, so you want to first separate those two. All right, because that way you're going to be, you won't be sort of fighting with the carrot as far as how wide something is. All right, it'll just make it easier for uniformity of cut. The reason why uniformity of cut is important is because you want your pieces to be the same size so they cook in the same length of time. Okay, so once you've got that done, there's a few ways that you can do it. What do you guys want to see first? A slice or a dice or anything in particular? I can just show you. Slice? Okay, so a slice is easy. The first thing you want to do if you just want rounds is keeping that tip on your board. All right, you're going to do the same thing. Yep. So keeping that tip on your board. And then that way, you're, while you're, you're using that claw, just like you are with all of the cuts, you can feed the carrot through the knife and control how thick you want your slices. So if you're looking for coins, like maybe you're making glazed carrots, you're only going to feed it through a little bit at a time. If you're making chunks, then you can feed it through faster. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes if you want half moons for your carrots, you would take your length of carrot, cut it lengthwise, and that's how you would make those half moons using the same technique as you would for the coins. I held it this way, put it down, and just put it down on the board and went that way. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing that people sometimes ask with a carrot is how do you dice a carrot? Because they can be a little bit tricky, right? And it goes back to what I was saying about creating that flat surface. So whatever vegetable you're cutting, you want to do that flat surface. So you would just shave a little bit off of that round part. So if you have that intact carrot, just cut off like a millimeter from that carrot. And then that way, you've got a nice, solid surface, okay? If you want your dices, do you see what I did, Jules? I'll do it again. So if you've got your carrot, you wanna create that flat surface, you're just shaving a millimeter off of it. You're holding your carrot steady with your left hand or your non-dominant hand, and then just shaving off a little bit. So you're creating that flat plane, okay? Yeah, you got it, Jules. Feel, yeah, you're, you're on the way. Yeah, absolutely. And so if you want your dices to be really fancy, like all square, you can play dice with them, then you would do that on each side. So you're essentially creating squares where it was round. Right? And they'll be more or less perfect depending on the carrot that you started with, right? Now you don't want to throw these guys away. They're great to munch on while you're cooking, okay? You can make imperfect squares, or you can always save any of your vegetable scraps to make veggie stock from scratch, okay? Just by simmering them with water for 30 minutes. But once you've got this square like that, then it's just like we did when we cut the onion, when we cut the pepper, okay? We're making those long cuts first. All right, so now we have what are known as planks. A lot better than some of the planks that you do in exercise class. 
And then depending on how comfortable you are, you can stack these planks to make your squares by doing another long cut, or you can do it one at a time. You've got your plank flat on your board. You make one cut down the middle. Good. Remember, trying to keep your fingertips out of the way, right? So now you're left with all of these batons. These are good for carrot sticks. These are good for veggie tray, okay? Or, again, you stack them together on your board, make the claw, and you can make a diced carrot, which looks pretty fancy. So once you've got those sticks, you can really do all kinds of good. making a super fancy cut that's called a brunoise. If anyone has seen that on TV before, see Julie, you've got skills you don't even know. <laughs> and you can look on the cover of the little packet I made you, and if you can see it clearly enough, there's um, different shapes on there, and that shows you all of the different sort of cut styles that you could do, okay? But these are the basic ones, what I'm showing you today. Any questions about that stuff? You're all busy with your carrots. All right. Now, after you're done with your knives when you're at home, you do want to make sure that you wash them, that you take care of them, right? So you're always going to hand wash your knives. You do not put your knives in the dishwasher. They don't like it, okay? So always hand wash your knives and dry them off. And then the best way to store them would either be in a knife block if you have it, or you can get one of those magnetic strips that hang on the wall. Have you all ever seen those? Okay. And then that way, they're right there. They're in front of you. They're not going to like stab you in the hand while you're reaching through the door. Okay. Um, those would be the two best solutions. If you are traveling with a knife and you need to make a quick knife cutter, like I did last night, cardboard actually works really well, okay? Again, just measure it according to what your blade is, and you can just staple it, and it fits, all right? And so that's a way, if you find yourself traveling with a knife, um, and you may find yourself traveling with a knife because we're going to do a drawing for a prize, so. Um, this knife. I did get it Target, and it is the OXO brand, which, yeah, it's a good, solid brand. It's like a workhorse brand. This is a stainless steel blade. The reason why I chose this particular knife is it's completely affordable, okay? It's around the $20 range. It's got a nice handle. The grip is one where you're not going to be sliding around, all right? And it's a good all-purpose size, okay? So again, OXO, it's ergonomic handle, that's what you want to look for. Whatever handle, when you get the chance to like shop for a knife, just choose whatever handle feels good for you. I have large hands, so a larger handle is okay for me. If you have smaller hands, then you may want a smaller handle, okay? But we've got everyone's names in here that signed up for the class. So I'm assuming that y'all signed up ahead of time. That's weird. I know, we're all going to smell like yummy onions, garlic, and basil. Caitlin Scott? Hey. Congratulations. All right. So I could go on for like hours and hours, but I know you guys have to get back to work. Um, if anyone has a specific question and they want to stay after and talk to me about it, then I'm happy to answer. But otherwise, that is the end of our next field. Thank you so much for coming. I have a question. Yes. So from the 